Border Crossings Project and the Art Gallery of Mississauga. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today, a sunny Saturday afternoon in December. So before we start, I wanted to say again, thank you so much for joining us. So as a part of the Border Crossings series, we have been showcasing artists throughout the month and we are gonna have another two events. One next week, it's gonna be Nora's Wish. It's gonna be, it's gonna be read by Noreen, who is the author. And the week after, we're actually gonna do a holiday um, watercolor painting. So always check out what's up on all of our social media program uh, platforms. And uh, again, everything is free for the community. So before we start, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather and which the region of Peel operates. It's a part of the treaty lands and the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, indigenous individuals inhabited and cared for this land in particular. And forgive me, Eric, if I say this a little wrong. We acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabe, Huron Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples the land that is home to Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit's First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land and by doing so give respect to its first inhabitants. And we continue to respect the land as we move forward in today's workshop. So today's beautiful workshop is focused on Eric Johnston, who is an indigenous drummer and storyteller. And we are so happy to have you here again and to focus on you and the songs that you're going to share with us and stories about culture colonization and whatever spirit tells you to share so we're going to start by asking a couple of questions and then i'm going to put the spotlight on you okay eric sorry <laughs> fine. that's fine now, um, you're, now you're on the spotlight video so please if you want to introduce yourself um, and more of your background, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, these are strange times. I never thought I'd be uh, doing a, a virtual session like this before, but it uh, takes a little getting used to. I'm, uh, <clears throat> for myself, um, I come from a fishing community uh, up past the Sound area in the Chippewas and Awash. It's uh, called Nia Um My involvement with singing and songs started in when I was about 20, so that's just about 40 years ago. Um, anyways, it was at that time we were, we were pretty lucky because we had an elder from uh, our community who was also involved in singing at that time and he would make the three hour three and a half hour drive to where we were in that college and university and he'd, uh, teaching us how to sing and he would do this about a couple of times a week and then that summer we uh, made plans to move back home for, for the summer so we could form a drum group and then start to sing a uh, continue learning and, and singing songs. Uh, there was a, a, a lot of the songs he was sharing with us were pretty much known within the powwow circuit at that point. Um, we kind of knew that there was a deeper uh, perception to these songs and outside of knowing we wanted to be involved with, with these uh, in terms of our relationship in our own identities that uh, uh, we were happy with just kind of learning the, the ability to keep a beat and, you know, uh, remember songs. Anyways, um, I continued on in uh, school, got involved in education, research, uh, you know, I finished my degree in uh, history. I got another diploma in legal arts administration, so I kind of got involved with politics with, with some of that. Um, but most of my employment history has been around research and history. And um, I was lucky enough with uh, part of my travels to go and live with a family in, in Kanora Lake of the Woods. 
uh, it is a very, uh, there's a, a lot of knowledge and very, uh, you know, there's a lot of traditions and ceremonies you, you might not, not find anywhere else in that area. Um, and I guess it's, it's all powered by a, a, a spiritual relationship that, that continues to uh, take place up there between the, the, the people there. And, uh, and I, I think it is the same as uh, among other indigenous communities as well. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, stay with this uh, one elder and uh, Alex Skeed and he had, uh, I, I had been singing up to that point before I ran into Alex uh, Skeed, I was singing for about eight or nine years. And uh, he, uh, I heard he was in town in Ottawa when I was working there. So I went downtown and I sang with him and his son all, all weekend. And they, uh, he invited me to um, come up north and live with them. And uh, he teach me how to sing. <laughs> and I was, I was like uh, flabbergasted because it was a very special uh, invitation that he offered me uh, by a, a really well-respected elder. And um, within a couple of weeks, uh, I found out that there was a job whole thing up there that I could have, uh, I, I got asked if I wanted to go and I said yes right away. So within a couple of weeks, I was in my brand new Z28 with the T-bird roof and I was heading on my way up to uh, Lake of the Woods area to, to live for the next couple of years. And that's really where my education and singing, uh, I, there's a, there's, you can get a certain amount of knowledge at, at, at Powell gatherings, but there's uh, the, the real deeper understandings of why songs are sung and why they're the shape that they are all that kind of information was uh, the pieces that I didn't even really know I was looking for, but as soon as I heard them, I knew that those, those were the pieces that uh, allowed a much bigger worldview to come into focus. So um, the one song that I sang a, a few days ago was, was a veteran song. And these are the songs that you'll find sung at many gatherings. Um, there, uh, there's there's two songs. There's you know all, all the way any tribe you'll you'll find that there's there's this category of songs, and those are shared within uh, how I'll gather. And some of them are more protected. Um, I'm going to turn this up a little bit. Um, some of them are more protected uh, songs that are because of their a ceremonial usage, um, but most of these, like the these songs, uh, are some of them are also protection songs. Like some people would say, well, they're they're veteran songs, but at the same time, they're uh, also protection songs for, for some people. Some of those songs were given by their their father to their sons before they went into to uh, uh, conflict. And so um, there's a number of stories that I, I could talk about that particular uh, uh, category of songs, but to, but to say that uh, this is, uh, there's teachings out there that, uh, there's teachings in history that, that follow all of these songs. And you're not going to get all of the understandings in one conversation. Um, it's going to come in by certain pieces and certain other uh, over probably a, a number of years. Um, it's a very uh, large uh, story that uh, has to be brought into focus. Uh, and some of that story starts in the Ohio Valley uh, among the Omaha people. And uh, with some of the singers I've traveled with, they said, you know, that that's really where the big drums were. Uh, has its beginning. There, there's a number of uh, big drums that are uh, part of this history. And the Ohio Valley seems to come into, uh, uh, becomes a focus point because that was where up to that, up to that 16th and 17th 
entry there was uh, westward expansion wasn't really able to happen until they found a way to get through the mountain uh, on, on the New York side. So there was a very, it's hard to march an army through those mountains if you don't know where you're going. And so you had a lot of tribes who were being displaced out of the, the, the coastal area, uh, pushed over the mountains and homelands within the Ohio Valley. Uh, but in that valley too is also the Omahas. And the Omahas were, were said to, to be, this is where really the, the one of the people that uh, tribes that get pointed at as, as, as being the origin of, of, of the big drum uh, is that, that that's the place. It also puts the Omaha people right in the path of uh, a lot of centuries of, of conflict, and expansion, and, and war. And um, you'll find that these drums are being pushed into the, into the far south. Uh, they're among the Kiowas. Uh, you'll find again that other parts of the history, you'll find that those drums heading northward again, up, up into the, the Minnesota areas. Um, you'll find again, them, they're being pushed down into the south again, into, uh, towards the California areas. They, they come up to the, the Blackfoot regions up on uh, the, the west coast. And it starts to make its journey to come across again back towards uh, the Great Lake region. And within that, and the history of the two people, and the, again, the Anishinaabek people start to uh, become part of this bigger story of the big um, migration. And there's, there's certain uh, events that happen where deeply profound spiritual relationships were developed with the drums. People already had their, their, their own drums, their hand drums, water drums, uh, ceremonial drums. There was uh, all these songs that were, were still there. People were already uh, in, in possession of these things. Uh, but uh, the big drum was, uh, it, it carried a, uh, it carries a, a big relationship with it in terms with the Sioux people and the Anishinaabek people. And so there's there's a lot of history and, and, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna disrespect that history because it's, it's, it's the kind of story that uh, should not just be told in five minutes or 10 minutes. There, there's a lot of uh, valuable understandings uh, the one that I, I probably could mention that it, it was part of a peacemaking relation. And that uh, the, some of the, the teachings and the understandings that were shared in, in that, creating that peace uh, was that it would be the warriors who would carry those, those drums. And that's kind of like a, a, a very quick uh, description. It's uh, more about uh, that the warriors will, will carry those drums, but there was also pipes involved too. Um, the, the drum, they, they said, well, you know, it's, it's one thing is the, 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 the warriors carry the drum and the, and the drum is the heartbeat of the nation, but it's also, uh, the, the sound of life, and it's that heartbeat that is the sound of the mother's heart, the baby's traveling from the spirit world, that is the child, that child's spirit is listening to that. And so when it follows that sound, it's following its, the sound of its mom, it's uh, the heartbeat of her mom, it's the heartbeat of the family, it's the heartbeat of the community, and then it's, it's the heartbeat of, of the nation. So that there's there's that understanding. So when you when you, when, when even the whether you're, you're black or, or, or you're a Chinese Asian person or a white person, you put the kids beside the drum and you'll see them start to dance. And that's because they remember that. They remember that sound that they, they were listening to and, and everybody else was listening to that that comes to the physical world, I guess. You know, that's 
that's uh, I'm really talking from this this world view that was being shown to me up in Lake of the Woods at that time, and it started to make a a lot of sense. So what you what you end up talking about is um, is that there's there's a, a a whole world view that comes along with with these songs and the type of uh, arrangement that. Um, and I can speak for Anishina big people. It's 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 a it's a it's a it helps create it helps express the relationship that Anishina big people already knew was what was uh, was there. Um, Anishina big knew that there were pine pine tree songs, there were bear songs, there were wolf songs, there were fox songs, there were sunrise ceremony songs, and there was sunset songs there was naming songs there was like there's all, all these different songs that uh uh people uh would have they and they would they would have it as, as a as a vision quest they would have it in their, in their nights of sleeping and you would um just by the structure of the songs you know that 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 um that that kind of musical arrangement uh is uh, uh, very, very uh, unique. And that uh, these, these songs are, um, uh, are an expression uh, of what the human relationship is, is to the land. And that these, uh, uh, many of these uh, many animals will, will will come to people, and, and not and not everybody. I mean, you kind of almost have to be in, in in the right frame of mind to be able to uh, be approached to be a, a custodian of, of one of these songs. And so that kind of that's kind of where the protection part comes in is that you you you're uh, there's uh, certain other teachings that come with each one of these songs in terms of what are you supposed to use it. Uh, when when are you posting music for? Um, um, so that kind of boils into the other song that I sang the other day was a uh, uh, honor song. So it's, there there are a number of honor songs. There there'd be honor songs that would be sung um, if someone knew that uh, this other person that that was their dream song that that was their one of the songs that they were given that uh, the other people would would come when when they would recognize that person, they would sing those songs for them in, in that recognition. It would be like you're, you're singing their songs, like there's a, there's a song of Crazy Horse that's out there and, and after the battle of Little Bighorn, that was one of the things they did was they, they sang, sang a song and uh, in his recognition. And you don't really hear these songs anywhere like the, uh, other than the people, because this is all uh, oral history that, that, that so, Knowledge is being carried and uh, transmitted into, into future uh, for future knowledge of future generations. So within the Kenora area, um, you know, although you may start off with uh, a, a certain powwow type of uh, idea that people can go to these days after the morning, as you can start to go. To in the north, the way they would describe this was because that they didn't really have uh, cars and planes and automobiles and all the rest of it. Was that there would be uh, one big drum, and there would be just one gang of drumsticks. And what would happen is that they would have to wait for people to come from different regions, and so they would sit there for sometimes a couple of weeks. And there would be people arriving all during that time uh, from those different regions uh, of, of the territory. And as soon as they got there, they would say, okay, we've been coming for a day or two now. And they would just hand the whole drum and the system covered that the next group that was coming in and say, okay, you sing the songs from your area. And those songs would all be the dream songs or the other songs that people were, were gifted with. And they would get a chance to hear the bear songs from that area or the wolf songs from that area, or whatever, a teaching song, 
healing songs or other songs that, and so it was, it, it provided a, um, there was a much uh, different focus, it was still a community social type of uh, experience that was uh, part of the gatherings. Um, Quick question sorry. about the sorry. Quick question about the gatherings. So when that would happen, it was different tribes or, or different um, communities. I, it would be different communities. Some some of the tribes, like they were, they uh, there there could be other people, other tribes involved in coming to some of those gatherings. And it, it wasn't it wasn't uncommon to 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 see each other. Okay. Um, yeah, it, uh, there, were, there was always understandings in terms of land usage, in terms of uh, a sharing that, that, that was going on. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that was, uh, if uh, people understood, like if you were, uh, if you had your pipe with you, a lot of times that people would understand, they would, they would it was kind of like a, a form of diplomacy that people would, would recognize uh, all the way across uh, everywhere. It was if, if those pipes were brought out, they, they would know that, that that's a, a very uh, open, peaceful uh, gesture for, for people. And that you, um, people just respected, respected that. Um, anyways, um, the, that, I try to kind of keep to my note here because I always uh, end up in the weeds uh, talking about some of this. <clears throat> um, one of the things I, I wanted to to air, um, like they 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 say that they, you know the, these songs they 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 take the shape of the land, and so uh, you'll find that uh, Kiowa songs are different. Uh, you'll find that Navajo songs are different. Uh, you'll like there's there's different shapes and flows to to how uh, your notes are being organized and different uh, um, melodies are are put together. And they say, well, that's that's a direct reflection reflection of the lands that they, that they, those songs come from, and the relationship that the people have developed with those spirits in those in those lands. We, the Sioux end up having with, with their song. You know, there's there's a, a very different flow to to, uh, and there's and there's different teachings that that come in, in their in their languages. Those, uh, and so when you when you start to hear and listen to Anishinaabek songs, that there is a, a very unique structure and and uh, rhythm and. Uh, as that's reflective of the territories that the Anishinaabe uh, people inhabit. So you have very high notes and it goes on to lower notes and it goes on to high notes again and it goes on to lower notes. And so that is the shape of the territories that we, our, our people live in. Um, so that's, uh, that was one part, you know, and I was sitting around with Alec and his family and then that was one of them had said a uh, shit uh, part. And then uh, another part would be uh, uh, one Alex's son was explaining to me, he was saying that, you know, it's uh, our, our people were so in love with the land, it was that we were so intimate with the land that uh, we really, you know, we, we loved it. and and. And he says, and that, that is why, uh, it's, it's just like your, your parents, he says, you, you will never leave the land, you'll never leave something if you really, really love, you'll, you'll stay in touch with it in, in, in some form. And he says, so our, our, our ancestors, when they go, they, they don't ever really leave the land, like they're, they're still here. He says, so with your mom and dad, is that your mom and dad, they, they love you so much, you love them. Uh, they will never leave you either. And whether that's you dreaming of them in, uh, even long after they're gone, that you will, you will dream about them and they will come to you. 
with you. And they will come and help you if, if you need it when you, when you call on them. So when uh, the, 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 the teachers will, will say, well, okay, so when you, when you sing that song, half of it's going to be way high, high stuff. And uh, Alex is like, well, we may never know. We only know that they, they really like those songs. And they will come to wherever those songs are being made because they're, they're happy sounds. They're, they're beautiful sounds. And they, they, come to, they will come to those, those places. And he says, so that half of that song is meant for those spirits, those, those ancestors, probably your grandparents. Um, the other half of the song, when you sing in our language, as that half of the song is meant for the people that are here right now. And he says, and so when you put the most of them together, he says, half of, the, half of it is for the spirit world, the other half is for the people that's here right now. And when you sing the two together, is that that creates the opportunity for us to be reunited with our, with our grandparents. And he says, you, you sing those songs, and uh, what the elders would say is that, you know, when, when they die, they, they, uh, they go to a place where time can't follow them anymore. And they, he says, so time has no influence on us. And so when you sing those songs, it's that they, they will travel through the future. They will, they will come to uh, when you're, when you're, when you're, on them that they they will come to where you are because you're uh, at that particular moment you're you're the most important thing of why they ever existed in the first place. So that's kind of a the, you know when and when I heard these these uh, uh, pieces of or these teachings and and you know it was almost like I said well that's the last piece that picture came into view. The whole worldview finally uh, came into focus, and so you you talk about uh, a, a relationship uh, to the land that's not only very spiritual, but it's it's animals that are helping you uh, achieve that relationship. Because you bring those songs with you; uh, those are the ones who are also bringing you messages. Um, and so it, it's it ends up being that this this these are all um, part of the communion uh, that was established by indigenous people across the North America. They have this relationship. I mean, they talk about a sacred relationship. That that's the kind of relationship they're talking about. Got nothing to do with money. It's got nothing to do with. Uh, uh, trying to uh, over perform for, for your own gratification. What, what you're doing is you're uh, becoming part of that relationship. Uh, you're trying to maintain that relationship. You're, you're trying to echo the things that will help the next generation to understand what that relationship is and how they can be a part of that. Anyways, um, all that got messed up by colonization. <laughs> you tell, let's be c candid about that because there are individuals here, there's uh, an individual who's tuning in from India, who is, it's very late there, but is riveted by the stories that you're telling. So, and it's very tough to access your wisdom. So please talk to us about colonization. Um, other, you know, I guess be, even before that, you know, it's uh, part of what I, part of the perspective I want to engender um, or put forward to, to people is that even in Europe, uh, you know, that they, they had tribal ways, they, they had tribal understandings. Um, before the Irish was this, uh, you know, by, by the Roman Empire or, or, or by England. They, 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 they had tribal ways, they had, they had tribal ceremonies that they would go into. Um, there was always a spirit in a forest or within the crypt that had to be a, a priest. You had to get some uh, 
um, be on good terms with. You know, there was an offering or something that had to be made there. And so I, I can only uh, contend that uh, they were still in tune with the land. They, they still had those relationships. They, they most likely spirits were, were visiting the group people. I, I think that this, this is just something that uh, it's probably is the most natural condition of the human being is to be able to have this kind of connection. And, this, and left to our own devices, uh, this connection used to emerge this, this uh, uh, there's there's probably all kinds of kids even, even today in, in these times that that have these kinds of dreams or these kinds of relationships but they don't really know what to do with them because we're, we're living in a, in a society that is so science based that there's no way to support those, those types of uh, experiences and, and where to put them and how to understand them and, and what uh, it, so I wanted to say that about colonization that, that uh, before the Romans got a hold of everybody that this was pretty much how Europe was operating it, uh, they got displaced uh, you know um, and, and I want to say that that, that uh, the, the new type of belief system that, that became part of the Roman Empire it really went out of its way to disrupt all those kinds of things like uh, um, anything that uh, where there was that would raise questions about destroying the land or anything like that. Like they, they those parts of the all got done. So it's not that far away in terms of looking at what happened in the North American experiences. The whole same attitudes, the same belief system across the ocean. And within year one, and saying, "Man, let's look at all these trees. Well, let's cut them down because you know, uh, it, it's a whole different world view, and, and uh, that uh, starts to extend itself and uh, in, in, in it's a North American colonization experience." There's also a relationship between uh, the man and, and the servant, or the government and the servant. You know, some of the some of that also needs to uh, uh, drawn out in, in terms of uh, that there was pretty big powers that were uh, developing or, or, or creating, powering the social order of things, both in, in colonial life and also in, in the nation. Um, what are the economic systems or economic ideologies that our people are using uh, and everybody finds them dependent on it. I'm, I'm not saying that they aren't, but I'm saying that that, that resource exploitative type of relationship uh, is really where indigenous people found themselves on, on the outside. Um, so colonies, um, I, I, I was, I would also say that colonization, there was a time in, in history, uh, there that, uh, black people, Indian people, any, any pe people of, of dark, uh, Scots, Irish people, uh, the indentured servant, English person. All of those people were thrown into the same uh, labor pool with the early years. They were living together. They were they, they were all being taken advantage of, but they were also having families. Uh, there was relationships there, and they were there was probably a, a, a form of the diversity and equality part of early experiences. And a lot of people don't know that that's how it was. They don't know that Africans and Irish people and Indians all ran away together. They don't know that they had families together. Uh, they don't know that, you know, there, there was a solidarity that was forming in these, in these 
early, early colony experiences that the plantation owners just did not want to see happen. These guys are going to rebel against us. If we allow these guys to have families and create this kind of solidarity, there's enough of them in there where they could end up taking over. We can't allow that to happen. So they did a lot of things to prevent that from happening. And one of them was to create laws that would encourage slavery to start to do. They used the same kinds of uh, logics to less indigenous people with their land because they were saying, well, they're not quite human. Uh, they don't really have the quality to be uh, an organized group of people. We got no rat, land rights, they're just a bunch of wanderers. And um, so you, you kind of get all these perspectives that are, um, and then you've got the, the Apple uh, government issuing Apple Bulls, and they're talking about dispossession of, of, um, of, of people who are not Christian. They're, they're, they're saying anybody who doesn't have Christianity in their lives, well, they won't. And so you, you get all these perspectives, uh, you get all these uh, private corporate interests up here, uh, the very first one being all around tobacco. Uh, and you got the indentured servant, you got the master servant relationship that's also being part of, part of that. Um, you got disposition of indigenous people that it, that is also part of these early experiences. You can kind of go walk that forward and to say, well, okay, um, you got slavery now, well on its way by the by the 1700s. Uh, you've got uh, a major foothold in terms of uh, European uh, immigration from the Europe's from Europe, and they they come in and they they get into the and then they start those mountains I was talking about earlier, and they start to go up the Isle Valley, and they start to go out, out that way. Um, so, within the Canadian experience, though, I, I, I think that uh, by the time that, uh, and I don't know how much more time we got. I'm, I'm this is another big topic. I'm, I'm we have about so the video that we have to play i think is around eight minutes so okay we have about 20 minutes left so okay. um if you want to finish that up we'll play the video and then we'll continue so you can finish off okay yourself. i'll just uh, finish off by saying you know the some of the research i'm looking into now is is talking is, is looking at well who were the founding fathers of confederation and when you when you look at those first people that were elected, like I was, I, the, the numbers are kind of like fifty one or fifty two percent are are lawyers and judges. Um, you got another high percentage of them are going to be uh, builders. Um, another high percentage are going to be uh, uh, in the in the fur trade industry. Um, you you. Uh, end up where, where some are, are uh, surveyors. Uh, you know, uh, some of them are starting to get somewhat into, into farming, uh, but they're, they're really, uh, what, what they're involved in is that a majority of them are representative of private interest with interest in natural resource exploitation. And so at, that's, that's who's representing representing Canada. So when you when you look at the, the Indian Act and how it's structured, uh, it has all the same features of uh, what the indentured servant and the enslaved black person had experienced. They had their nobility taken away, they had no access to law, uh, they had no access to the economy, they had no access to uh, Economic or, or any benefits that are uh, flowing out of the economy that's that's uh, existing at that time in history. Um, so you end up and you look at the Indian Act, and it's got all those same features embodied in that legislation. And that was basically what federation was 
mean then is that you would have one citizenship that was created uh, for one group of people, and you had the Indian Act create another citizenship that was created for you was pretty much any of any kind of right. There wasn't any really any uh, ability to participate in how the world was forming in, in those over those four hundred years. Yeah, anyway, but for that much. Um, so the next part of, of what we're doing here, I guess, is um, I wanted to uh, sing one small part of, of, of a song um, and just to give an idea of what I was talking about in the first song. Um, <clears throat> So I'll just sing it and then we'll, then we'll talk about it. And, we'll, and we'll talk about it and then we'll play the video. Yeah. Thanks. song is a like a prayer song so I feel okay about offering that one because I, I think for all the COVID and all the other people that are, are, are suffering in, in these hours you know I, I think that that's uh, I feel okay about doing that I, I usually don't put these songs out on, on, on a recording but I, I, I would probably say also that we're probably at a time where um, that indigenous people's beliefs and, and, and these kinds of commitments we have to the land. Uh, it's time for other non-native and other people to begin to accept those same perspectives into their own lives. Uh, because if the big plan is for everybody to end up with uh, a computer and a car and airplane tickets, who knows where, and you know the best bed that that's around, and the biggest TV that's around, and at the big uh, the big plan is that everybody is being talked into this, and that they can achieve this. Well, we're going to collapse the biosphere, and I, I think that that's uh, all, all the damage that that has been done throughout the world and in every country is people facing this, this vision, this private interest corporate driven vision and uh in any one century only a very small percentage had ever achieved anything close to any of that and whatever modern woman was uh being experienced in europe and uh you know hundreds well only a very small most of the people were outside on the land toiling away <laughs> you know working from from sundown, sun up, and and even even in today's society, we find that even our our, our people who are even our well educated, are running around, ten to twelve, fifteen hours a day, trying to do the same thing, and 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 just really paying for the roof over your head, paying for shoes on your feet, paying for food in, in your fridge. So we, I, I think that the, the the time has come to to have some, a bigger vision come into place. And by sharing that song, I would, I would, you know, 
put it out there to say, you know, there, there, there is a, there is a, a vision that uh, can be, um, that should be tried to be brought into focus that all of us that can learn, there's room for everybody in, in that vision. Anyways. Thank you, Eric, for, for sharing that with us. Um, we're going to play your video and then afterwards we'll have a question um, and answer period. So Daisy will put that up for us. Okay. Uh -oh. Hi, everyone. Okay, I'm going to play this now. Oh. 